Hi everyone. Um, do most people know me or are you a lot of unfamiliar faces, I guess. So um, yeah, so I haven't presented on this before, so bear with me if it um, I might skip through some things if I'm running out of time. But this um, so I've had a long involvement with CMIP um, since I started in NCAR in the 90, mid 90s, where CMIP 1, I think, was going on when I arrived. So um, I have also been an IPCC lead author where CMIP is made a lot of use of. So this is mostly going to be um, an overview of what CMIP is, how it's designed, how you could get involved, um, and some sort of emerging science topics that came out of the CMIP 6 workshop that I went to in March in Barcelona. Um, and it's input from um, Jingbo Wang at NCI, who are there um, curating the CMIP 6 data on Rajan. <coughs> and then I've stolen a lot of slides from other talks. So hopefully I've got all the links. So what is it? The coupled model into comparison project. Did everyone know that? I was going to ask you what you thought it was first, but there it is. So it's, um, this is kind of the outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so we'll start with what is it and how is it designed? Why do we need more than one model? Um, why intercompare models? So I think you've probably learned a lot about how models are put together and what um, their components are this week. Um, but we also, I just wanted to give some context of why CMIP exists. And then we'll get on to CMIP 6, which is the current phase and how it's working and how you can start looking at it. Um, so I guess, has anyone used CMIP data in their research in the show of hands? Yep. Um, and has anyone else read CMIP 5 papers that use CMIP output? Yeah. Okay. So not everyone. <clears throat> That's good. So I wanted to take a, a step back first and kind of describe um, what we mean by um, climate projections. And CMIP um, is more than just climate projections, but that's um, a what a lot of it um, gets used for, say, in IPCC. So you'll be hearing from Matt Wheeler tomorrow about um, climate prediction. And so in, in, when you're thinking about numerical weather prediction or seasonal prediction, the initial state is really critical. So you're, you're initialising with what we know about the observations right now, and then you're running the model forward um, to predict the state in the future. <coughs> And so in those kind of systems, we don't conserve mass or energy um, because we're trying to match the observed state and the models um, uh, can't conserve mass and energy if we're trying to force them to be in a certain state. Whereas a climate um, model, when we're trying to think of long-term kind of um, climate um, simulation, uh, it has no dependence on the initial state, so they initialize from some observed or modeled climatology. Um, and in these ones, conservation of mass and energy is critical. So model developers, when they're devel developing their CMIP version models, spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the um, models don't drift. Whereas in the top one, the models are drifting, and you have to bias correct them for the drift. Um, so that's kind of a critical thing to understand. In the bottom one, we don't have El Ninos happening at the right time. We don't um, have anything kind of that's happening at the same time as the observations. But they are designed to be um, representative of what we know about the observed climate, the, the world's climate. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what is CMIP? So there's a link there um, that you can all click on if you want. There's a nice little four minute video which I won't show you, but if you haven't really delved into CMIP, that might be useful. And so the obje objective here is to better understand, am I on actually? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> better understand past, present and future climate changes arising from natural, unforced variability or in response to changes in radiative force in, in a multimodal context. So you can see it's much more than just looking at projections into the future. It's really, um, it's not tied, it's, it's not actually controlled at all by IPCC. <coughs> it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it began in 1995 and is organised by scientists. So it's organised by people like you and me um, through this World Climate Research Program's working, on, working group on coupled modelling. <clears throat> so it's really just to better understand the climate and by intercomparing models, the hope is that we'll, we'll 
glean some information of how the climate system works and through that we'll um, improve the models. So yeah, we've been coordinating these multi-model experiments approximately every seven years. Um, it has been fairly tied to IPCC um, cycles, but the current phase is trying to get rid of that, um, that link in, in terms of the timing somewhat unsuccessfully so far. <clears throat> so just to reiterate the kinds of models that we are using, they're these coupled models, they're um, in balance at the top of the atmosphere so they don't drift and they just run out of the box, they spin up and then um, they have a stable climate. But you can see that they've changed a lot since um, we've been thinking about, say, CMIP in the mid-90s. Um, before then, they, um, they only really had carbon dioxide as forcing input, um, and a lot of them were atmosphere only. <coughs> but then, yeah, aerosols were added um, in the early 2000s. We had a lot more... Um, interactive vegetation, carbon cycle things added. And then in this round, um, some of the models have ice sheets and there's a lot more um, biogeochemistry and um, interactive chemistry in the atmosphere as well. Um, and there is, yeah, a nice um, FAQ, I think, that talks about different... Um, it maybe isn't the right one, but in Chapter 1 of AR5, it talks about different... Um, climate models over time. So as I said, they've been doing this for a while. We've um, <coughs> uh, So starting in 1996, and I've got references at the end if you're interested in learning more, um, the goal was really just to document the systematic errors. So different modelling groups around the world, I think there were about 10 at that stage, um, were running their models and this was one way to, to say, okay, what's um, common amongst the errors that we're finding. Uh, and so yeah, in in this kind of phase, they discovered things like, um, you know, most models uh, have two warm oceans over um, to the sort of southeast, like in the southeast Pacific. Um, and that was linked then through these kind of analyses to cloud biases. <clears throat> um, and it was also to quantify the effects of flux corrections. Have people heard about flux corrections? Um, so it's gone, gone out of fashion it sort of went out of fashion, it's maybe coming back again, but flux corrections at that stage were needed to stop the models from drifting. You just couldn't um, get a stable climate model because the errors um, were too great. And so you had to add these flux corrections at the surface um, to keep the model in balance. <coughs> but you added a constant flux correction, so you could then perturb CO2 into the future and, and see how climate changed still. Um, but the idea was, the hope was that we could get rid of these flux corrections by improving models, and um, down in these stages, that did happen. Um, and in CMIP 2, it was really fairly soon after CMIP 1, that was really when they started looking at climate response in these models, in a multi-model context. Um, and then it started becoming more sophisticated. We started having scenarios at the time. They were the S-Res scenarios, A1B, B1, that kind of thing. Um, we had these 1% yeah, per year compounding CO2 experiments to look, really look at the uh, transient climate response. Uh, had some idolized experiments. And then CMIT-5, which is the one that um, most of you will be familiar with, had these um, Similar experiments, but with a different set of scenarios. CMIP 6, which is happening now, we have um, what's called the DEC, which I'll talk about, which is just a standard set of experiments. We have new scenarios again. And now we have 30 different other experiments, um, experiment MIPS, actually. So it's really hugely expanded over this time frame. So how is it organised? Um, it's... Um, all voluntary, as I was saying. So here's the, the members on the working group for coupled modelling. You can see um, <coughs> there's sort of a member from each modelling uh, centre. So for access, we have Simon Marsland is our representative. And then there's um, some sort of members from other um, committees from the WCRP that sit on it. Um, and... Yeah, I guess what I would say is that it is all voluntary. Um, there's no real funding except maybe to organise a conference once a year. Um, and that's something that's really 
becoming critical now, I think, going forward because these experiments are obviously used to set policy um, and they can't really just be done on a smell of an oily, oily rag. So that's definitely a discussion that's happening now at, at the WCRP level of how to better fund CNIF. Um, so the WGCM, Working Group on Coupled Modelling, has a CMIP panel. Um, and this is fairly new, I think, that they um, set this up. But Dr. Veronica Eyring is the panel chair. She's awesome. Um, and here's the, the members on that. And so, yeah, I guess their main um, responsibility is to oversee the design of um, the CMIP experiments. Um, and also how the sort of governance and infrastructure around that. So how is it actually organised from phase to phase? Um, so for the last phase, CMIP-6, it, it began while um, the IPCC reports and the CMIP-5 experiments were still being run. They started thinking about the next phase, and that's the same now. They're already starting to think about CMIP-7. Um, so... Yeah, they surveyed the community, um, came up with an initial proposal for the design. Um, there's various articles that were written to try and get feedback from everyone. And then they finalised it in a, one of their annual meetings. Um, and there's, there was a lot of community consultation about how the um, experiments should be designed and the structure of CMIP. And so I think that was a really nice project that... Uh, sort of way of doing it so that everyone did feel like they had a say. Um, so, again, this is how um, the current CMIP is organised. There's this panel, um, and importantly in this phase there's an infrastructure panel, so the data is all um, distributed across the world and there's a lot of... Um, things to think about in terms of data curation and, and um, how everyday scientists like you and me can access that data. Um, and a lot of standards um, that have been put in place for that. Um, also, like I know with CMIT-5, it was actually really difficult to understand what, um, what actually modelling groups uh, used for their forcing data sets. So this input for MIPS has now put that in place so you can actually query and see oh, oh, what ozone forcing did um, each modelling group use, that kind of thing. The data is housed through this Earth System Grid Federation, um, which I'm not going to talk a lot about, but if you use it, you'll, you'll work it out, you'll find out about it. And I've got some slides from NCI about how to access the data. Um, and then, yeah, importantly, we now have this routine evaluation tools that are set up, and they're also available at NCI if you're interested, that um, just routinely produce things like global temperature time series and um, rainfall, climatologies compared to observations, that kind of thing. So I'll talk more about that. Okay, so that was a very brief, um, quick overview of how it's organised. It's kind of not very interesting, but I think it's important so that you know that it's um, there is... A, ways that we can sort of be involved in, in making the decisions of um, how these model experiments are run. So why do we need more than one model? Does anyone want to hazard a guess or give some input? Biases. Biases, yeah. So that you can look at sort of the spread of their responses based and constrain it with their biases, yeah. Yeah, Melissa just said that Gab was unfortunately unable to come on Monday, so you haven't heard about um, a lot about how, um, yeah, a lot of the models have similar characteristics. And, but Christian's going to talk to you next about model evaluation. Anyone else? Say anything? Um, so... One of the reasons is that um, we can't actually say, we can't actually get to a one single best model. Um, and that's because there's this diversity of equally plausible approaches to modelling the climate system, especially when you're thinking about future climate change. We can't actually um, look at the 2090s and observe them and then test our models against them because we don't know what that state is. It's, it's in the future. 
Um, and because we have to parameterize a lot of things, um, there's lots of different ways you can do that and, um, and it's difficult uh, to really say one model is better than the other. People are, are definitely trying. There's also numerous modeling centers worldwide and there's kind of, I guess, a, um, in some ways, a feeling, well, a need for each country to have a model that they can use that um, we can teach students with and that we can use to, for our own kind of purposes. And so there's numerous modelling centres that want to, to be studying the climate and projecting it. So, And yeah, I guess finally, attempts to link model performance to projections, so to look at how well they've performed over the historical period and use that to say these ones are better for the future um, has proven really difficult. There's some more kind of techniques coming out now that are trying to do that, but um, it's really hard to say to wait a certain set of, use only a certain set of models to say this is how El Nino is going to change in the future. Um, it's just scientifically not, we're not able to do that yet. So basically we have to use the whole multi-model um, distribution to look at how the climate might change. Um, and so this is one example from the AR5 where they looked at um, different projections from a high emission scenario um, at the end of the 21st century. And you can see over the Atlantic, they had really different responses, even to this, um, you know, quite a lot of warming, four degrees of warming by the end of the 21st century. Um, if you lived in, in England, say, you might have quite a different climate um, that eventuated if you chose that model versus this model. Um, and then, yeah, this, so this is just global mean temperatures um, from the different scenarios of the future. And these bars here are the multi-model spread. So you can see that this, um, there's quite a range um, of potential futures, um, even across models for the same scenario, let alone the different scenarios. And so that is what we would call climate sensitivity. So the models, when you um, double carbon dioxide, uh, they have various responses to that. And you've probably heard about climate sensitivity already. Um, and, and it's been really difficult to constrain that. That's something that the climate community is really trying hard to say, if we double CO2, the climate change, global temperature change will be two degrees. But we have not been able to um, lower the range for the last 30 years, it's been about one and a half to four degrees. <clears throat> um, okay, so that's why we need more than one model, but why um, do we want to, in, to compare models? So I guess this might seem obvious, um, but it consumes huge resources when you're thinking about it. Um, in terms of uh, data size, also the number of um, Supercomputing hours is um, enormous when you're thinking of carbon emissions. It's um, a huge amount of energy is being used just to run those models. Um, also the human time, there's a lot of people that are um, trying to produce these sim simulations. So it needs to be justified. Um, and so I saw some quote that it's arguably, CMIT 5 was arguably the world's largest, most complex distributed database. So they're saying, maybe larger than Google or CERN, like it's huge. Um, and it's growing as well. So CIMIT 3 was 40 terabytes, CIMIT 5, 1.5 petabytes. Um, and so that was at least 40 times bigger. And the numbers for CIMIT 6 are, are quite astounding. In CIMIT 5, we had 40 models contributing. CIMIT 6, there's already 100 models that are um, going to contribute output. Um, so it is, it's large, um, and I know at NCAR we started developing the CMIT 6 version, um, I think in 2015, and we didn't, f I think it was version number 300, close to 300 before we actually finalised it. So that's three years later, three years of, of lots of experiments trying to get the model um, to the final version that we wanted. So here's some reasons, and this is from Veronica Iring's um, talk in Barcelona. So it enables fundamental research. So the goal of, of CMIP is to better understand the climate system, and this is a way that um, it can 
enable us to do that. We can look at lots of different models for the question that we are interested in. And there's thousands of research papers um, using CMAT5 data. It highlights systematic biases um, and it helps set model development priorities. So one thing, um, for something I'm interested in was in CMIT3, there was a paper um, published by Joe Kidston, who was at UNSW um, postdoc, and, and Gerber, where they noticed that the position of the southern hemisphere jet um, in the model's climatology was strongly correlated to how much it shifted in the future. And, um, and so that, I guess, highlighted that if different models had these biases in the position of the, the jet, and that was something that we wanted to try and um, improve on. Um, I would say that I have friends who, like I have a good friend who's head of the land model working group in, at NCAR, and he says, we already kind of know what's wrong with the models. It's just a matter of having time to improve it. So it's, it is one way that it can help address um, model priorities for de development. It's not the only way, obviously. Um, it does allow the models to be scrutinised by the whole climate research community. So previous to CMIP, each um, country would have their, their climate model, um, and it was really difficult to have other people from outside that institute, say CSIRO, to look at their output. Um, and so this way, because the data is on this distributed network, everyone can, anyone who wants um, to do research can look at it. I would say it's not free if you're um, a private company. There's terms and conditions. Um, and crucially, it does provide input to IPCC um, assessment reports. Um, and increasingly, it will be part of this global stock take in terms of um, carbon budgets, carbon um, targets for the UN FCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, which came up with the Paris Agreement, which is trying to limit climate change to below two degrees or even one and a half. So here's just one example of where it um, highlighted systematic biases. Um, and so this is a, a figure from um, FIFADEL where you can see the black line is the CMIT5 models. The multimodal average, this is global temperatures from 1950 to I think at the time was 2013. And the grey shading is the spread of the models. And then the coloured lines are what was happening with the observed climate, um, observed global temperatures. And you can see that um, the observed temperatures were kind of going outside of that spread from the models. And so um, this really, I think, um, definitely promoted a lot of research into trying to understand what, um, what was causing this mismatch between the models and the observations. There's some studies that have come out saying maybe the observations weren't actually slowing down um, quite as much as we thought. Um, but I think CMIT-5 really enabled a really close look at what forcing was used in the models. So there were some suggestions that the solar um, constant had kind of gone through this extended minimum, a low amount of solar radiation coming in, and, and that wasn't in some of the models. Um, there was some feeling that stratospheric aerosols might be contributing to this slowdown, some sort of small volcanoes that wasn't in the models. Um, and then it also really had a look at internal variability as a contribution for that, which is what most of the consensus is now, that it was just this really strong bout of decadal um, climate variability in the observations that we wouldn't expect the models to get at the same time. And the decadal prediction experiments were really useful in, in looking at that too. So I think this is one example where um, CMIT-5 yeah, really did um, help to answer some fundamental science questions. Um, okay, so CMIT 6, and how am I going? Cool. Sorry, I definitely want to get to the science part at, at the bottom. Um, so a lot of this um, material comes from this CMIP 6 model analysis workshop that was held in Barcelona um, in March. And these are really nice workshops if you are uh, interested in, in going in the future. I think the next one will be 2021. They're mostly posters. 
so similar to our clicks workshops, I guess, in that there, um, there's like, you know, really only a handful of, of plenary talks and then it's all posters. And it was really the first time that people developing their CMIP6 versions of the model, so the modeling groups and model analysts were able to get together and discuss um, what was coming out of the current experiments. Um, Yeah, and all of the presentations are on that website there, if you're interested, um, including we all had to give lightning lectures, so the one slide from the lightning lectures are available as well. So um, CMIP6 uh, was designed around the World Climate Research Program's grand challenges. So um, that's these nice things. Um, so these are what WCRP um, a few years ago decided were the really fundamental science questions that we should be focused on as a climate community. Um, and yeah, so the links I think are there if you want to click on them later and, and look at what they're doing. And so the working group on coupled modeling is um, in charge of this one, clouds circulation and climate sensitivity. Um, but I think CMIP really goes, can be useful in answering all of these um, grand challenges. So they came up with these um, science questions that CMIP 6 is really focused around. So how does the Earth system respond to forcing? So that's you know, CO2, but also aerosols, ozone, um, land use, um, volcanoes, lots of different, different things, solar radiation um, variability. What are the origins and consequences of systematic mo model biases? Um, and how can we assess future climate change uh, given climate variability, climate predictability and uncertainties in scenarios? Um, so those were the, the main questions that they wanted to answer and then they got together and came up with certain experiments to answer that. And so each CMIT phase comes up with different types of experiments. So this is what they came up with. <coughs> so um, instead of just having um, the experiments change every CMIT phase, they now um, want to have a standard set of experiments that persist through each CMIT phase. So um, that's a good way to be able to compare and um, different model generations. So we can keep the same experiments um, from CMIT 3, CMIT 4, CMIP 6 and into the future and really see how the models have um, progressed and changed over that time. Um, also, if you want to be part of CMIP as a modelling centre, you have to run this historical simulation. And then everything else you don't have to do. So um, this is really just what you need to do to, to be part of CMIP 6. So it's, it's really not that many simulations. It's still a huge undertaking for, for certain modelling groups, but I think that's part of this really huge expansion we've seen in in the number of models participating. Um, there's also a real focus on standardization um, in terms of how CMIP is designed and, um, and the infrastructure behind it. Also a lot better documentation in, so that we can actually understand what modeling groups, um, how they set up their experiments. And then um, they called for these uh, other MIPS that were focused on more specific science questions, say like paleo um, climate change or um, scenarios. So this is the common experiments, the DEC. So it's the, um, what D is, something entry uh, and K is for Klima, which is um, the German word for climate. Um, so this is from the access um, coupled model. Um, this is a, a slide that Martin Dix showed at the Access Science Day a few weeks ago. So the pre-industrial control simulation you can see is in this blue or these different lines. They've got a few versions. And this is what I mean by we need these models to be in balance. So you run them without any changes in forcing and they just stick to the same, same temperature. If, you, if I showed you one of these from, say, um, Access S, like the seasonal prediction model, then they would quickly be cooling and, and going out of balance. So um, the pre-industrial control and then um, the abrupt four times CO2 where you just suddenly um, quadruple carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and see the response. 
AMF is where you prescribe observed SSTs um, for a certain period and then this traditional 1% um, CO2 increase which is used to calculate the transient climate response um, which is another measure of climate sensitivity. And then if you want to be part of CMIP then um, CMIP 6 then you need to also run this historical um, simulation um, which is this is an example from the CSM2 the latest model from NCAR. And so these are using um, all the observed forcings that we know about, volcanoes, solar, ozone, um, greenhouse gases, aerosols, um, etc. So um, in CMIP 6, there's, I think, as I mentioned, a few um, new panels. And this one is doing a lot of work that a lot of what I, stuff I don't understand. It's all about um, really documenting the data. There's now, we're hope, expected to, I think, have DOIs for all the data, the model um, output, so that it's really traceable and really transparent. Um, there's also the forcing data, um, an infrastructure was put around that, and there's um, papers written on all the forcing data sets. Uh, and then there's, yeah, other infrastructure support. Support. There's also one of the key things coming out of CMIP 6 is these routine evaluation tools um, that we also have at NCI that you can just quickly create some, some analysis from. So all of the information um, about CMIP 6 is in a GMD special issue. And there's lots of really interesting papers there if you um, are interested in any topic. And I'll, I'll list the different MIPs that have these special issue papers um, later. So I think, yeah, I've already showed this, but these are um, some of the MIPs that were proposed, and I think they were a bit blown away by how many uh, modeling centers wanted to do these. So that's kind of why it became um, really a huge um, experiment. So to be, anyone could propose a model into comparison project. So for example, there's one on scenarios. Um, and then for it to be endorsed by the CMIP panel, um, at least eight modeling centers had to agree to run it, to run the experiments that they were proposed. So Scenario MIP came up with um, different future scenarios of um, uh, concentrations of, of future emissions and um, yeah, many modeling centers agreed to do that because it's important for IPCC. So here's a list of them. You won't be able to read them, but I'll just highlight a few of the science highlights from some of them. Um, so, and yeah, on the CMIP, this webpage, you can click on each of them and they talk about why, what their goal is. And there's usually a paper sort of justifying what their experiments they want um, and the kinds of science that they expect to come out of it. Um, yeah, I guess, and this is just showing that um, these different MIPs down here are mapping into the different grand challenges. So some of them about science eva model evaluation and some of them are about these, answering these grand challenges. Okay, so just quickly on the infrastructure and how you can actually um, access all this output. <coughs> um, so this is the part that the modeling centers are doing. They're running their experiments, they're creating output. And then there's this huge infrastructure around how we then, how that then gets to us. Um, so there's this um, software that basically allows it to be distributed with um, securely. Uh, and so different nodes around the world host the data. So NCI is hosting it here. Um, and then these, these new tools to routinely evaluate it. Um, and then, yeah, I think I've mentioned some of these. There's a lot of work going on in um, creating observational data sets that can be used to, to evaluate the models as well. So these are some of the, the things that come out of these tools. So this ESM VAL tool. Um, and just as an example, I was working on, um, say, the. I was involved in the future projections chapter in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. 
And every time a new model came in, we had to recreate this figure. You know, we had someone that had to manually download the data and, and, and recreate and add this extra model. But now there's tools that basically have taken all, most of the figures from, from the IPCC fifth assessment report and then they just push a button and, and it updates the figures that they need. So the idea is to get away from, you know, allow scientists to actually do science rather than um, be trying to be updating kind of routine figures. So the routine evaluation can now be done by these tools. So that's a huge advance and a, a really um, exciting one, I think. Um, so as I said, um, our, uh, at NCI in um, Canberra is hosting um, CMIP6, and this is from an update that they gave at the AMOS workshop a few weeks ago. So there's two access models that are participating in CMIP6. And um, so they'll be running those historical and um, abrupt CO2 experiments, for example. But they've also um, committed to participate in these MIPs, so Ocean MIP, FAF MIP, which is fluxes, I think, um, radiative forcing MIP and scenario MIP. And then, um, yeah, this, this one is um, more with the Earth system capabilities with biogeochemistry involved. Um, so they're not available yet, but they're hoping to um, start getting some data out soon. So if you are interested, um, they have some recommendations about how to search for the data that you're interested in. Um, so I'm just putting this up here so you have the information um, for later. And um, yeah, basically if you want to CMIP6, output, then you have to join this group at NCI, OI10. Um, and they'll keep the CMIT5 and CMIT3 output as well. So if you want to compare with previous generations of models. Okay, science. So I wanted to make sure we had some time to talk about some of the emerging science that's coming out. So have many of you may have heard this already. Many of the CMIT6 models are much warmer than the CMIT5 models. Um, have, have people heard that in the news at all? Or, yeah. Um, and so these are the equilibrium climate sensitivities that um, Veronica showed in, in March. Um, and so that's the temperature response to a doubling of CO2 um, and it's when it's come to equilibrium. And so traditionally people just used to run these with a, a slab ocean so that you could quickly get to equilibrium and now there's a method I'll show you that they use to, to do it now. But there's a lot of models that are up this end, which is, you know, five um, to six degrees warming. Um, whereas the equilibrium climate sensitivity from um, IPCC has been between one and a half to four and a half degrees for the last 30 years. Um, and so there's a lot of news articles that are coming out about this. Um, and um, Gab and I wrote actually a, a piece that's on the CLEX website if you're interested in, in learning more about it. Um, you might think that this is kind of some metric that's not very uh, useful in terms of you know, trying to understand the climate of Victoria and how that might change. But I think um, this article nicely shows that if, if it is true that equilibrium climate sensitivity is warmer, then um, it has implications for a lot of things like um, carbon budgets that might be um, talked about in, in the next um, UNFCCC meetings. It has implications for ice sheets, things like that. Um, and just one thing though to say is that this equilibrium climate sensitivity assessed by the IPCC is not only based on these CMIT models, it's based on paleo records, it's based on observational constraints. So it's just because they, these ones are coming out warmer doesn't mean that the IPCC will say the climate sensitivity is warmer. So why are um, they more warm? Um, so this is one example from the NCAR models that I'm familiar with. So CSM1 was our CMIP5 version, CSM2, um, it's the CMIP6 version. So it was released a year ago. Um, so this is the abrupt CO2, four times CO2 experiment. So you basically just um, run it um, for as many years as it, it takes to come to equilibrium. So the CSM1 you see kind of came to equilibrium fairly quickly and then was fairly um, flat, whereas the CSM2 has this 
quite different trajectory and, you know, isn't really coming to equilibrium even under, after 200 years. Um, and this is the typical way that people assess what the climate sensitivity of their model is. That's so this um, Gregory method. So RESTOM is just the um, top of the atmosphere or the top of the model radiative balance. So um, it's the solar minus the long wave. And then you basically draw a line um, through here and where it hits this intercept is your climate sensitivity. So you can see two things. Um, in yeah, the CSM1, it was quite linear. Um, CSM2 has this, what they're calling an elbow. So it takes a while um, to become linear. And this is highlighted, and there's a lot of papers coming out about how to assess climate sensitivity. It's um, not, it, it really depends on the time period you, that you look at it. And so um, that's one of the emerging science topics, I think. So in terms of why this has happened in CSM2, they've, um, this presentation is really nice in, in trying to document what changed. And they did a lot of experiments where they, you know, they, they changed a thousand things between these two model versions in all of the components, atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, land. Um, but one of them seems to be this change to the clouds in the Southern Ocean. So that a lot of models had a really um, not enough clouds in the Southern Ocean in their CMIT-5 versions. And so that meant the SSTs here were too warm because they let too much radiation in. Um, and that bias is, has been um, improved. They've changed their climate carb microphysics, I think, is the main way they've um, increased these supercooled ice crystals in the clouds um, and, and removed some of that bias. Um, and so that then changes the cloud feedbacks that you get when you um, perturb the climate system by adding CO2. Um, and um, that seems to be one of the reasons. But they um, can't, they've backed out some of the changes and they can get some of, can get back to CSM1 um, through backing out some of the atmosphere changes, but it's clear that it's more than the atmosphere. So the ocean and the land also seem to be playing a role in this increased climate sensitivity. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that the, um, there was a lot of talk at the CMIP6 workshop about the aerosols. Um, and how the aerosol forcing has changed between CMIT-5 and CMIT-6. There's a lot of different aerosol emissions that have been updated. Um, and a lot of models are now really struggling to recreate the um, historical period. Um, so it's not as clear in, in this um, version, but um, I think you see they're, they're too warm here and they're kind of too cold. And here's a version using different models from the workshop that we're, we're showing their climate, their global temperature time series over the historical period. So you can see some, they just really don't warm until, you know, the late 1990s, and then they see <coughs> that. Um, and this is common in this one. This is the E3SM from the US. I think this is the UK model. So this is going to be similar to Access. Um, this is the CSM, this is the MRI model that has a lower climate sensitivity. So there's still a lot to understand. The modeling groups actually don't understand why their climate sensitivity has increased yet. Um, but there's kind of some indications it's to do with clouds and to do with the aerosols. So um, I'm involved in running these detection attribution um, MIP experiments. So with the NCAR model. So these are these historical runs where we uh, separate the different forcings into different components. So aerosol only, greenhouse gas only, natural only. So the blue boxes here for DAMIP are the ones that they want all modeling groups who've signed up to it to run. And then they have all these other aspirational um, experiments that they'd love people to do to understand better. Um, and so the one I think would be great that we did in Australia that um, the access model hasn't signed up to this MIP, so I'm not sure we'll, we'll get these runs soon, but maybe in the future um, would be this stratosphere-only um, simulation to look at the effect of the ozone hole and ozone recovery on our climate. Um, this is from Scenario MIP. So Claudia Tabaldi at the workshop showed some of the first results from the CMIP6 models on these um, scenarios of the future. So again, this is global temperatures. 
So we have these new scenarios. Um, they're called shared socioeconomic pathways. And these are the RCPs that we had in the last, um, last CMIT 5. Um, and so you see the, the dark blue ones are designed to be close to what the RCPs were. So they're similar forcing pathways, but they wanted to update some things. Some of the um, land use change was not great in the, in the RCP. Some of the, I think, aerosol recovery was too fast. The aerosol yeah, cleanup was too fast, so they updated a few things. Um, and you can see this is the CMIP 6 models, and this is the CMIP 5 um, RCPs. Um, and so I think this is temperatures above present. This is the um, above pre-industrial. So this yellow line, which you probably can't see, is the one and a half degree kind of target. Um, and so you can see there's some that really are, are going much warmer towards the end of the century than we had in the last round. And then the last one I wanted to highlight was the Decadal <coughs> Climate Prediction Project, MIP. Um, so these, uh, I know I said that CMIP is mostly about these coupled models um, not initialized, so not initialized with the observed state. Um, so <coughs> these are the weather predictions that we're used to. CMIP has traditionally been about these long kind of term climate projections. Um, but there's now this kind of in-between um, experiment type where you need that forced boundary um, external forcing, um, but also want to initialize the models. So um, they've proposed a bunch of hindcast to see if you initialize, say, in the 1990s, can you reproduce the slow warming, slowdown of warming? Um, they've got predictions for the future, so routine kind of decadal predictions, and then also some. Um, case studies, I guess, which really try and understand how does the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans interact and, and what's causing what in terms of decadal variability. Um, and I'll just say there was a, a nice poster by Rowan Sutton that was showing um, how in their model the, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation was really tied to their aerosol forcing. So these things, what we think of as internal variability, decadal internal variability, can also be really interacting with the forcing and, and driven by it. Okay, so the next steps. Um, I've got a few minutes. Um, there's this desire to decouple, I guess, the standard experiments that um, CMIP does from the IPCC. And they really tried to do that um, last time, but um, it, it didn't really work because modeling centers just want to keep developing their model until the very last minute. And so um, they know that the deadline really is IPCC um, paper submission, which is the end of this year. Um, so they just keep developing until they, they can't develop anymore. So, um, but I think it, it's a nice infrastructure that we now don't need to change much going forward. Um, so yeah, this you won't be able to see, but this was the timeline. They wanted all the model groups to have run their experiments by 2017, but um, really they're only just coming in now. So um, there was a lot of discussion at the workshop about how we can kind of um, do that better, and they're already planning CMIP 7. Okay, so here's just a summary. We've got, um, yeah, I've hopefully given you some material to show that multiple models are really essential um, for future projections, and, and that intercomparison does enable a better understanding of the climate system. So. Even if you're not looking at the future, you can look at El Nino across models and, and really get a handle on how um, El Nino works and the different ways of um, parameterizing the things that might effect, affect El Nino, for instance. Um, and yeah, I think CMIP has been a really nice model, but it is ever changing and improving. Um, there's a lot of remaining challenges. And I think one of the biggest challenges is how to get better support for, for this infrastructure. It's, um, yeah, it's really, I think uh, some of the problems here were to do with the fact that, you know, one single scientist was coming up with the ozone forcing for, for CMIP. Um, and if that person got sick, then that was, you know, a point of failure. So here's some opportunities. Um, NCAR is having a hackathon. If people know about those, we just all get together and I think analyze and write papers. Um, 
it doesn't say it's only open to US people, so if you want to register, um, have a look at that. Um, Clex, um, Anna and Margot are organising just a, a meeting to talk about data challenges, so if you are getting ready to dive into CMIT 6, then um, get in touch with them to talk about that. Um, and this is the IPCC timeline. Papers, if you want to get cited in AR6, need to be submitted by then, but um, CMIT is much more than IPCC, so analysis will just keep continuing, so there's, you know, you don't need to, to worry about um, jumping on board right away. <coughs> the WCRP is organising a lot of sessions around, um, around CMIP um, as part of the Climate Science Week at AGU, so there's the links for that. And here's some references, um, a lot of the things I talked about. And I also wanted to highlight that CSIRO and the Bureau and um, as part of NESP and the universities are um, talking about the, the projections for Australia, which always happens sort of a year or so after IPCC comes out, and how to analyse the models in that context. So, thanks. This one here? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'm not sure. I, I just know a lot of modelling groups changed their, um, their cloud properties for the supercooled um, ice crystals. But I'm not sure if this is something that's standard in other models as well. The problem with trying to work out what fed into these biases is that many things change at the same time, and so it's, it's difficult to isolate it, yeah. But no, that's a good question. Looks kind of like a SAM response. Uh, I think uh, this is the main reason we do extract the practical to understand the artificial process causing that changes. And that is, we are running a lot of MIP, like SR, which is the one of the part of that, to run the statistics and forcing and trying to understand. Yeah, so the... Why this is happening. Yeah, the CF MIP, I think. The Climate Feedback SMIP is doing a lot of experiments um, to get to that. I know at NCAR they've run some energy balance models to try and, and back out the changes. Um, so that's in Cecile's um, presentation. Um, but it's, yeah, it's kind of more at the global scale. What happened to SMIP before? <laughs> um, so, yeah was CMIP um, was always kind of a bit behind IPCC numbers. So there was the third assessment report, um, which people called the TAR, um, was in 2001. And then um, CMIP, uh, the fourth assessment report was coming out when it would have been, uh, was tied to CMIP 3, and then they just thought this is silly to have a, a different number. So they just skipped CMIP 4. Yeah, there was no CMIP just to get the numbers kind of consistent with the assessment. Yeah. Um, to be covered in the next project, so I'm talking about early the NK card requirements. Is there any additional test on the credits? In terms of, yeah, I think there's some discussion. So no, I think you just have to be able to do all these experiments. And so, like I think some, we have decadal predictions um, group at, at CSIRO who are using a different model. So I think they won't be part of CMIP6 because they um, won't have the setup or the capacity to run all these experiments. So you can be included in CMIP6. Whether you get into the IPCC is a different matter. So um, I know when I was involved in the fourth assessment report, there were some models um, I think 
they, they didn't have westerly winds in the middle of latitude, they had easterly winds, like <coughs> some really crazy biases. Um, and it's really difficult to throw out a model, but there's definitely more, um, more steps towards doing that, to weighting the models and to, to really looking at um, whether to include them. But in terms of CMIP, it's all voluntary. We're not going to tell you you can't participate. Yeah. There's no one saying you have to do it. And that's one of the issues is also there's, um, we can't make modelling centres submit their data by a certain time. It's, it's all voluntary. So um, CMIP 6 never actually really puts deadlines. They just say if, you know, just people know that if you want to be part of papers about IPCC, that, that get cited in IPCC, then you probably want to have your model output there six months at least before then. 